today we're going to focus on the end of scene three when he's on the floor, the green presence shows up. So we'll just start off with the green light. Until, until, until is a performance, which I'm calling a play that is based on an actual performance that Ben Vereen did in 1981, where he decided to do a tribute to the vaudevillian performer, Burt Williams, at the 1981 Republican Gala, which was a celebration of Ronald Reagan's election. The first act was like a straight up minstrel show. So when he came out on stage, he was dressed in blackface, which is surreal in and of itself, and did this really moving tribute. And then the second part is where the critique was. He's trying to assert his, his manhood, but okay. he realized but that- ABC edited out that second part and only showed him doing a minstrel show from Ronald Reagan and like, you know, 25,000 white Republicans. Well, these here, these are my friends. Lie. And two days later, Ben was surprised to learn that all the people who were part of his circle of friends and supporters, they all abandoned him. That's quite all right. I, uh, I just forget my place sometimes. Now, this is the thing. Even if America had seen it, I am not convinced that most people would have thought that it was a good idea. <laughs> That's the reason why I wanted to do it, because of that uncertainty. You're marvelous! And the power of what art is, which is distinctive from other fields, is its unruliness, which ultimately means that Art is not inherently good. It's not inherently bad, but it is inherently contradictory. All right, I'll sing it. Its nature is to ask new questions. It's a complicated place, and it's so big. I mean, there's still parts of it I've never seen. But this route will give you a sense of the different LAs and how it's broken up into these invisible barriers of class and race, you know? It's a very different experience when you get to see the other part of LA where, you know, where regular people live, working class folks live, you know, from where I came from. It's just always been home to me. Um, but you know, all of my family's here and I'm a third generation Angelino. My mother's like a really good storyteller. So, you know, she would really bring the past to life. On Sundays, like after church, she would be in her room, you know, like lying on the bed and one of us would go in there and lie down, and then the other one. And next thing you know, like, all six of us would be in there on the bed, like, Mom, tell us some stories about Grandpa. Like, tell us some stories about your childhood. So I'm named after my grandfather. Yeah, he was a painter and an inventor. And part of the, the story of my name is that, you know, I look like him, I walk like him, I talk like him. But he died a couple months before I was born. So I could accredit probably my interest into philosophy and religion and science to that anomaly because I started asking myself early on, like, how could I be him and be myself at the same time, you know? Drawing for me is both a technique, but it's also a methodology. It's a way of thinking about how we make connections between things. And this is a, a big rig truck that's crashed into the side of a church. 
This is like a collision of belief systems, right? And when I was in my undergraduate studies at Art Center, I remember, you know, encountering like all of these car accidents, and it seemed to be that there was some kind of pattern that existed to it. And then I started to think about it more philosophically, which is like, you know, why is it that we consider car accidents and car crashes to be random? Because randomness is defined by a sense that we live within a logical and reasoned universe. I'm constantly trying to figure out how you could talk about big ideas, but through images that are somewhat familiar. So within the space of making a, a body of work, the thing that I'm trying to talk about is not necessarily in the picture. You know, this is just like making a drawing, you know? Yep. It's all the little tiny detail stuff. No comment. <laughs> Maybe we should just make a drawing instead. I know, I know, I know. The Library of Black Lies is both a library and a labyrinth. Because you know, like the difference between a labyrinth and a maze is that in a maze you're supposed to get lost. But in a labyrinth, you find yourself in the middle. And I still don't know what's in the center of this one. This is one of my early experiments, thinking about the limitations of what we can know. That even though the book has been destroyed in some way, like you can't open it and read it any longer, it's taken on a new form. So I don't know if this is going to make it in the library or not, this particular one, but I am going to be crystallizing some books. And this may be what's in the middle. But you know, the other thing about uncertainty is that it's something that you can't ever get rid of. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a necessary product of exploration. Ideally, that's where innovation comes from. That's where something new comes into the equation, is when you allow for that, that uncomfortableness, that sense that you don't know. In a lot of ways, you know, the Black Lives Project is a way of examining the library as a means by which to transform oneself. Because, I mean, we live in an information age, so, like, there's information everywhere. I mean, it, doesn't, it hasn't radically transformed society in any greater way. I wanted to produce some troublesome juxtapositions between knowledge as something that has power in itself and knowledge as something that can be harnessed for political purposes, either to suppress or to transform one's position. This idea of the American dream is the thing that we're all working towards. But at the same time, a lot of people are recognizing that they haven't gone anywhere. The reason why I use mirror is because I try to use materials that have certain properties that trouble things. And this one, it troubles the gaze, you know, like you, there's no neutral place to stand. It forces you to contend with the fact that you are reflected in it somewhere. This is a project that's called A Book and a Metal. By coincidence, I come across these two letters. The first one, um, what's known now as the suicide letter, was sent to Martin Luther King in, in December of 1964. And essentially, the letter 
said, we know your secrets, and if you don't stop, we're going to expose you. And then at the end, it said, you know, and you should just kill yourself. It turns out that the letter was sent to him by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. A time comes when silence is betrayal. In the show, what I was trying to do was to explore the vulnerabilities of a person who's in a position of leadership. Beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us... Martin Luther King is a historical subject and has been monumentalized. He's been turned into a kind of a, a superhero. I cannot be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness. In a lot of ways, I mean, the project of democracy as a true possibility is really predicated on how the United States deals with its legacy of genocide and slavery. So I didn't want to produce a situation in the show where you felt like this was done because this is still ongoing. Um, as a matter of fact, it could be unresolvable. And I think, to some degree, some people may be thinking that this might be as good as it gets. So like the I Have a Dream speech, where I may not get to the mountaintop with you as a metaphor, I wanted to put that on the table and say, let's, let's analyze this. Will we get any better than this? And I, for me, I'm not sure. Thirty years ago, a man did a performance that was meant to challenge the status quo, and it sort of irreparably damaged his life in the process. He was willing to go on this journey with us to bring this piece back into the public in the way it was meant to be seen. Let's make a great show. I have to be quite honest, I never imagined that I would ever do anything with blackface. <laughs> it's not a subject I have any interest in. But yet, here I am. If you've seen the video of Ben Vereen at Ronald Reagan's presidential gala, it's one of the most surreal things that I've seen, and it's haunted me for 20 years. We were on the phone yesterday, and it actually was really, really moving. I was sort of brought to tears during the, the call. Oh, no, ben no, said, no. listen, you know, you have to do this piece your way. So take this material oh. and, and run with it. You know, it's yours now. I just forget my place, sometimes. So I'm even getting choked up right now just thinking about it. But you know, it was, it's, if that happened to me, that kind of betrayal and humiliation, you would hope that there would be somebody out there who would want to kind of pick up that mantle. And I could sense from, from him that, independent of if the piece is great or not, he knows that there's people out there that care now, you know, that what he tried to do 30 years ago, this may be that time. Maybe now is that time.